Our ancestors claim that the earth has been ripped asunder and the entire surface reshaped by cosmological catastrophes that the planet suffered. These events were diligently recorded by all of our ancestors, and now, in the present, they are completely ignored. If instead we stop discarding everything that our ancestors claim happened to this planet, a completely different picture of history emerges. We find ourselves facing new challenges in trying to figure out what happened in Earth's past. We know that there have been horrific cataclysms all over this planet, but how recent could they possibly really be? The evidence is everywhere. All we have to do is open our eyes. Now, while the Earth has suffered tremendous cataclysms on multiple occasions, the last two major cataclysms will be our focus today. The first and most deadly cataclysm that sets the stage would be what we now call the Venus event. The Venus event took place during the 1500s BC in mainstream chronology, but the reality is this event was probably only about 2,000 years ago. That event, the Venus event, when Venus passed Earth in cometary form multiple times, came so close that it completely destroyed the face of the planet. Our ancestors record all of this. After that event happened, millions, hundreds of millions of people were wiped out. Very few survivors were left. The survivors began to pick themselves back up. They started to fan out, and they began to remap the world in its new form. These maps would only be maybe 1,500 years or so old. That is not too far away. It's even more interesting if we look at the age of sail, and we find that these people would have been even closer to the remnants of these people who would have drawn the original maps. This means that any cartographer who was trying to find source maps in their age, this means that any cartographer that was looking for source maps may have had access to the maps created by the people who survived the Venus event. This means that those maps may potentially contain land masses that no longer exist because after the Venus event, over time, more of these pieces of land sank into the ocean. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. Look, I pay for the software, all right? I'm learning how to use it, and I've learned how to mess with my voice. You're going to have to, you know, I'm going to do a whole show that's just like that. It's just me going to be laughing like that, just... <laughs> like, that's going to be the entire show, and I'm going to loop it for like a thousand hours. You watch. It's going to... Uh, okay. Let's talk about a continent buried under tons of ice. And no, I do not mean Antarctica. We will talk about that later, and plus there's like a billion channels out there with 10 million different alien theories and, you know, whatever. But nobody really talks about Greenland. Dude, Greenland is insane. I mean, look, look at this thing right here. The, the, pff, Greenland's mere existence in its current geological formation, by that I mean covered in thousands of feet of ice, that's insane. Because one look at the map, I mean, if, okay, let's do it. Look at a map. Why do we find Greenland covered in thousands of feet of ice, but we do not find other areas of land in those same latitudes covered in ice as well. I mean, what the hell is going on? Why is it there's just this one continent up in the northern hemisphere that is covered in a ton of ice, 
and everybody else is all good. Like nobody else has anything else. There's no ice coverage like that at all. Yeah, it snows sometimes, but otherwise, the entire continent of Greenland is essentially a gigantic glacier. Ah, that's probably not the correct terminology, but whatever. You know, that's my point. I mean, how the hell do you get one, one piece of land? One, not multiple, nope, just one piece of land completely locked in under thousands of feet of ice. To make Greenland even more interesting, uh, Greenland's insane, but to make it even more interesting, Greenland is not even like at the North Pole. When we look at something like Antarctica, Antarctica, it's down there in the South Pole, and I mean like in the South Pole, it is the South Pole. You know, we, we look at that and, you know, it's not weird that there is a ton of ice down there. That, okay, yeah, makes sense. It's really cold. The currents go down there, the winds, all that stuff. You know, yeah, it makes sense. It would freeze down there. Why do we have a continent? I'm just going to call, yeah, well, an island. I don't know what they call it nowadays. The definition of continent got weird. Anyways, Greenland. Why is it there's this one chunk of land that's pretty good sized? Why is it that it's covered in thousands of feet of ice? This is a serious problem. All right, this is like hand waved away by everybody. Oh yeah, it's perfectly normal to have one random continent covered in ice and yeah, don't worry about it, bro. Just keep just keep, you know, drinking soy or whatever. You know, it's 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 insane. Why is it that we have a focused area that's not even at the pole covered in thousands of feet of ice? Now, the mainstream's explanation for the ice cover is simple. They blame it on the Ice Age. For some weird reason, all the other ice melted on the planet. But, you know, in Greenland, not really. You know, for whatever reason, Greenland essentially went untouched. I don't know how that happened, and neither do they. I mean, they've got, they've got some BS mechanics they'll try to spin. But the reality is... If all of the supposed Ice Age ice within those same latitudes melted, why didn't Greenland's melt as well? I mean, Greenland, like I said, is essentially untouched. I mean, yeah, it's slowly melting now, and that's just life, but it's still thousands of feet thick, and it absolutely outlived all of the other supposed Ice Age garbage. Now, before we go further, on this channel, the ice we've acknowledged that the Ice Age is not a real theory. The Ice Age never happened. So stuff, you know, gets even weirder now because once we get rid of the Ice Age, which is easily done scientifically, and I've already done a lot of that, and we have more to go, but the point is, is that we can scientifically eliminate the Ice Age as the progenitor for the ice cap on Greenland. All right. Now, mainstream science makes the claim that the ice sheet on Greenland has been there from somewhere between like 56 to 34 million years. Yeah, they honestly believe that the ice has sat there untouched, undisturbed, no problem. It just perfectly layers up right there for them so they can study it for 56 million years. This is insane. This is objectively crazy. There is no way around this. What, the fact that geologists go out of their way to look at this date and they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's a really good date, bro. Yeah, I'm glad you came up with that. Oh, it's awesome, very cool. You know, you just, oh, just Look, I'm not gonna start slapping geologists right now, but dude, it's coming. The slapping is coming. It, there's no choice. I mean, this if this is how geologists are going to approach the subject, if they're going to make claims that are ridiculous like this, 56 million years, 36, are you crazy? No, you, you can't you can't just do that and then look at me like I'm crazy for not believing it. That that is not how this works. We're not doing that. I refuse to be treated like that, and you should demand the exact same respect. Now, why do scientists believe that Greenland has been covered in ice for 56 million years? I mean, they might as well just say 12 billion and just get it over with. But why do they say that? What what possible evidence, reliable evidence could these guys possibly have that would give them that date and the main thing that these guys have access to is of course ice cores now ice cores are trash ice cores cannot they cannot be used to reliably date almost anything it's not that ice cores do not have scientific value they very much do 
But when it comes to dating, you cannot use ice core samples to definitively date a situation. So before we go further with this, because I really do need to make the case uh, for everybody to understand that the current mainstream impression of Greenland is not only wrong, it's absolutely bonkers. I mean, it's insane what these people are teaching the average person on this planet. So they use ice cores. Ice cores are trash. Why are ice cores trash? Why do we just make this up? No. Let me go through a few of the reasons why ice cores are garbage. Because once we can eliminate the ice core data relative to dating, then we can potentially redate the Greenland ice cap. And then when we do that, that might give us an insight into the people who survived the Venus event. So ice core samples right now in the mainstream, they are considered like reliable, right? You, you hear a scientist, they say, oh yeah, we have, a, we have an ice core and everybody just, oh yeah, yeah. Wow, that guy has an ice core. Ooh, look at that. Can I pet your ice core? I mean, that's like what it is, right? That, that, that is what mainstream science does. They run around jerking off ice cores, right? But that, there's no reason to do that. Ice cores don't make sense for dating. Here is why, right? So the first reason why, right? There's a problem with layer mixing and disturbances of those layers, right? So the problem is, is that snow and ice layers can be disturbed after they get deposited, right? So it doesn't, they can be disturbed all kinds of ways, right? They could be melted, refrozen, wind can show up. There could be all kinds of other erosional things. There could be entire shifts due to cracking of the ice sheet itself, you know, and then it shifts all that stuff. I mean, it, it, it right there, right there, the fact that layer mixing can happen is really all the evidence you need to dismiss the 56 million year age for the ice cap. <laughs> Don't worry, it gets worse for ice core enthusiasts. The next problem that can happen is the diffusion of gases, right? So one of the things that these people are going to look for are air bubbles trapped inside of the ice core samples. What they do is they melt it, they capture that air, and then they take measurements of what they are assuming is past atmospheric composition. This is an assumption right off the bat. Technically speaking, we have no reason that that is representative of the atmosphere at the time. Because they make that assumption, that must mean that they know exactly what was going on in the area relative to the gas mixing. So that means that they must already know what was going on in that environment right at that particular period of time to make the claim that that is indeed atmospheric gas. There could have been a plethora of reasons why that particular gas was trapped in that particular core sample or core layer, but without us actually physically being there during that period of time, we don't technically know how the hell it got there. So, right, so we, we cannot use gases to completely date anything. I mean, there's too many assumptions that are involved with using that. I mean, there's too many assumptions in the whole damn thing. Okay, anyway. The next problem that we run into is, of course, contamination, right? Contamination is a problem for any kind of an experiment. Same thing with the ice core samples, right? So once, once you start drilling, it's entirely possible that as, you, as you're drilling, some of that meltwater is getting into some of those core samples, meltwater that could have been from a higher layer, layer, potentially a lower layer being brought back up. There's all kinds of ways that you can contaminate an ice core sample. Not to mention basic contamination simply when you are extracting the ice core. You can have contamination right there and there's no real way for you to know what you're doing to contaminate it. So when you get the results back from the lab, you are assuming that it's not contaminated and you think that those gases are represent or whatever's in there, not just gases. Anything that's in there is representative of technically what would be underneath the ice sheet. But instead, it's really just something that was either mixed in on the way up or something you may have mixed in on accident. Right. So that's another problem. The next issue we run into is a local versus global representation of what the ice core samples represent. All right, we have to remember that ice cores, they provide climate records for very specific locations. When we drill into Greenland, we are not expecting to find the same climate results that would be in existence in Australia at 
the same time. So if somebody goes over there and they drill into Greenland and they get all their data and they're all happy and they say, yes, at 17.3 million years ago, uh, the atmosphere was like this. The problem with that is that that ice core sample can only tell you what was going on at that particular geographical location. That ice core sample is essentially not going to be valuable for trying to figure out ultimately what was going on on Earth because you can only get what was happening in that area, right? And the Earth is not a perfect closed system where if one thing happens on one side of the planet, the opposite happens on the other side perfectly, right? It's not a uniform distribution of stuff, of gases, of whatever the evidence is. So you can't use that kind of evidence to tell us what happened in the past like that for the whole planet. But that's what they do. They literally do that crap. Urgh, okay, okay, okay. The next issue that ice core samples run into is the problem of interpretation of isotopic data. So the when they drill in and they get their ice core, these ice cores potentially can provide them isotope records that are then used to infer past temperatures. Now we kind of already covered this with respect to the atmospheric situation, but what they will also do is they will use the isotopic data to try and say, oh yeah, hey, the planet was at this temperature then, or this temperature then, right? They, they, they believe they can actually pull reliable data out of an isotopic test. The problem with using isotopic ratios while trying to figure out what the hell temperature it was on the planet during that period of time, this data can be affected by all kinds of crap on this planet, such as precipitation, atmospheric circulation patterns, post-depositional processes, and all kinds of other things that we've already actually sort of talked about. So when they go and they look at the isotopic data and they say, oh yes, we guarantee you that this temperature was this at this period of time, it just doesn't work. Like it's scientifically not viable unless you already knew exactly what was going on back in the day. All right. Now, the next problem with ice core samples is well, it deals with the weight, and that is the compression of time at depth. So you have to remember, as snow compacts into ice over time and the ice sheets get thicker, older layers will get compressed. Right? So what happens when compression happens? You get friction, you create heat. What happens there is that the ice layers essentially will begin to meld into each other. Now at deeper, le blah, 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 deeper levels, hundreds or even thousands of years could potentially be compressed into just like an inch of ice. Ah, there are so many problems with ice core samples that you cannot use them reliably to date really anything. I mean, if, if we're going to be scientifically honest, we have to look at ice core samples and be like, hey, look, yes, they've got scientific information in them, but to use them for, you know, accurate dating of any kind, we cannot do that. So that means that the dates that the mainstream are giving us have to to be wrong, or at the very least, there's no reason for us to take them seriously because there's no evidence that they are real. Uh, speaking of the dating situation, I, I was giving the 56, you know, 23 or whatever the hell to 56 million year old date. Uh, there are geologists in the mainstream that will also say like 300,000 years or 150,000 years will pop up. There, there's a range of dates, right? So just keep that in mind as well. Even mainstream, obviously, does not have like a real date either. I mean, I know there's going to be a consensus in the mainstream geological sciences with respect to the ice sheet, but uh, even those guys, they're not all on the same page. So something just to keep in mind as well. So that 56 million year old date was just the craziest one that I've, craziest, is that a word? That's just the crazy one that I found. I thought it was funny. So I thought I would use that because I mean, mainstream historians and scientists are gonna make fun of us. So we might as well poke them back. All right, anyway. With all that said, we can scientifically make the claim that we really do not know how long that ice sheet has been sitting there. Is there a way for us to get that answer? Apparently, yeah, there is. So when we start to look at old maps during the age of sail, one of the interesting maps that pops up is what is known as the Xeno map. It's my contention 
that we can look at maps that were created during the Age of Sail and perhaps get an insight into what the planet looked like right after the Venus event happened. The reason why I believe we can do this is because while cartographers were starting to make a map of the world during this period of time, they were not just using the information that was being brought back to them from their contemporaries who were out there exploring. They did that for sure, but to fill in gaps, what these cartographers did is they used earlier source maps. Now, if you are a cartographer in say, I don't know, the 1200s, what kind of source map are you using that could potentially fill in an entire continent like, say, Africa. In the 1200s, nobody knew what the interior of Africa looked like, for example. However, for some weird reason, we find really detailed maps of Africa popping up around this time, if not a touch earlier. And by detailed, I mean really detailed. They don't just have the general continents, you know, shorelines mapped out. They also have the interior of the African continent mapped out as well. This includes rivers, lakes, all kinds of cities, you know, tropical forests, regular forests. It's crazy. The detail is all there. And all of these places even have names on the maps. It gets weirder because over time what will happen is that as explorers fanned out and started mapping Africa as it looked in their period of time, they started to discover that all of those maps that they had originally had were wrong. So you will find that Africa actually starts out incredibly detailed and then you'll watch the detail slowly fade away as the centuries tick on and then the detail begins to return as the Europeans started getting more and more geographic information. They had to start changing all of the data because the Africa that had been recorded on earlier maps, you know, with all the river systems and lakes and all those cities and everything, the explorers were like, hey, none of this exists. Like, what the hell is going on? There's no river system here. There's no, you know, jungle over here. There's no city there. What the hell are you guys doing? So eventually all of those things will be erased and replaced with the contemporary aspects of current Africa. So it really begs the question, what were these cartographers doing? Now I'm using Africa as an example, but this happens all over the world. For some weird reason, cartography in Europe starts out fairly detailed, and then over time it gets worse, and then it picks back up again. What this tells us, scientifically, is that cartographers during the Age of Sail had access to source maps which must have dated from centuries upon centuries earlier during a time on Earth where things like the ice cover of Antarctica or the ice cover of Greenland did not exist. Then, of course, there's the Pierre Reese map, and everybody knows about that map, but that's the map that supposedly shows Antarctica not only already mapped out before Antarctica had ever even been discovered, but it also displays the continent without any ice. Now here is where we are going to start to run into problems relative to mainstream history. So mainstream historians, not I'm not going to say all of them, but the vast majority of mainstream historians completely write off any map that has to do with Antarctica or Greenland. In this case, eventually, we will eventually get to that part of the show. But mainstream, they write this stuff off as just, eh, it's just some weird made up stuff or they miss, you know, they miscalculated something and they were drawing some other island or some other landmass in the area that Greenland and, and Antarctica are in. And, you know, they're just stupid. They had no idea what they were talking about. So, you know, they just make stuff up or whatever. You know, that's, that's the whole perspective from the mainstream. So when we look at something like the Pierre Reese map, for example, Example, uh, mainstream has already completely discarded it and they discarded it without doing any actual research to prove that the map was fake or was wrong or anything like that. 
This is where things piss me off. This is where you start to get angry because this, is, you know, how the hell can you look at somebody who's supposed to be, you know, trying to be intellectual and looking for the truth, but they discard information without any proof that allows them to do that. So, like I said, the Perry Reese map, for example, that no no historian really went out of their way and was like, oh yeah, we definitively ran all these calculations, we did all the trigonometry, we went, we, we went through all the records and we did all of our due diligence like we are supposed to as scholars and we scientifically proved that the map is wrong. They did not do anything like that. They did nothing is what they did. That's the that's the crappy part. These guys actually didn't do anything. So basically, just because that map goes against what they generally are supposed to believe, in this case that Antarctica, you know, nobody knew it. And, you know, of course, it can't have ice. I mean, what the hell? The fact that mainstream historians are willing to just push aside evidence like this for the simple fact that it does not jive with their current narrative, you know, that, that right there is your clue that mainstream historians, you know, they don't care. They are not on the right track. To make things even more interesting with the Pierre Reese map, for example, uh, even the military came out and said, yeah, this looks legit. I thought that was fascinating, and then there were even other people that came along and did some unbelievable good work. Uh, Charles Hapgood was one of those guys. Charles, Charles Hapgood and his students, they came along, wrote a big-ass book about it. Well, it's about other maps as well, and I highly recommend it. I think it's called something like Maps of the Sea Kings or something. Ah, we should talk about that, actually. Anyway, these guys, they really went into it. They did all the calculations. They did all their studying. They went through all the records. And sure enough, what they ended up discovering was that, yeah, this map was definitely representative of Antarctica without ice. And they even got the coordinates correct. Now, this actually brings me up to another topic when we deal with maps. Um, especially the further back you go, you're going to find all kinds of different kinds of ways that people were trying to create uh, something akin to longitude and latitude. So you'll see, uh, for example, you see like a lot of radiating lines coming out of certain points all over the map. There were different kinds of coordinate systems that were being developed back in the day when you know everybody was out there exploring. Even more interesting, one of the things that was discovered relative to some of these kinds of navigational markings is that whatever source maps these cartographers had access to, they accidentally ended up copying over some of the older civilizations' navigation methodologies. By that I mean whatever kind of a coordinate system was being used by the civilization that came after the Venus event, uh, that system didn't make sense to Europeans. Whatever, whatever or however that system was to be used, and this would have been what the cartographers during the Age of Sail would have been looking at, uh, they didn't know how to deal with it. Like, it didn't make sense to them because it wasn't like a straight-up longitude and latitude coordinate system. So what they did is they, they generally would ignore it, but some cartographers actually accidentally, or maybe even purposefully, because they thought they could use it, they actually ended up copying that ancient navigation system onto the maps. So if you look at older maps and you, and you see weird lines and you see weird geometric formations on there, there's a good chance that that is a remnant of whatever the older civilization used for their coordinate system. Now, of course, uh, we also discovered that uh, the longitude and latitude system appears to have also been employed uh, in the ancient civilization as well. I, you know, I'm using the term ancient. That's probably not right. Basically, whoever the hell survived the Venus event, uh, their coordinate system, they did indeed apparently 
they used a longitude and latitude system as well and some of that will eventually also come into play and be transferred onto some of the ancient maps and it will actually help dictate some of the stuff they end up correlating to what the explorers were finding that, that whole situation gets crazy but that's that's for another show because if i keep doing this we're never going to get to the purpose of what i wanted to talk about so you guys get it basically we have a situation within you guys get it basically we find a very weird situation to where uh cartography during the age of sail for some weird reason appears to have more information than it should and then as cartography progresses uh, a lot of that information starts to get erased because the explorers discover that, no, there's none of that stuff out there, so we don't know where the hell you got that from, but take it off the map, and they do. And then as time progresses, then the modern version of the world will then start to be represented on those maps. So, we find ourselves in a similar situation that Antarctica found itself in back in the day. And that is, for some weird reason, there were maps of Greenland without any ice. And this map is called the Xeno map. Now, if you go and you start to search up this map, the very first thing you are going to run into is you are going to find mainstream doing everything that it possibly can to discount this map being legitimate. And there's a few reasons why. The first reason is obviously how the hell could anybody know what Greenland looked like without ice back in that time period because there's no way since, you know, the ice has been sitting there for at least 150,000 years and upwards of tens of millions of years according to mainstream. So that already immediately is what is going to be used to discard the map. Now, as interesting as the Greenland situation is, it is not the only oddity. We also find several other islands represented on this map that no longer exist on today's planet. For example, we see Friesland sitting there as well. Friesland is also one of these weird landmasses that mainstream absolutely discards and throws to the side, but, you know, real history, if you go and you pay attention to actual real European history and you listen to what everybody talks about over there, Friesland was a well-known island. In fact, there's maps of Friesland that map out the cities that are in there. They map out all the rivers and stuff like that. There's all of these geographic details. You know, if you're going to make up an island, yeah, you could make up that stuff, but, you know, it, you kind of lose, or I should say the mainstream loses their credibility when you go and you find out that other cultures in the European area were trading with Friesland. Now, of course, that begs the question, where the hell did Friesland go to? So, this is kind of my train of thought now and what I want to get to. So when we look at these maps that are obviously, not obviously, I mean the cartographers admit it, they are drawing from older source maps. If these older source maps were drawn accurately, and we have every reason to believe they were. Like I said, there are amazing ancient coordinate systems that sometimes we can find ghosts of that have been transferred on to the newer maps, either on purpose or on accident because the cartographer had no idea what to do with it. So I could just see the cartographer sitting there, you know, smoking a fat blunt, you know, sitting there copying from some amazingly awesome ancient source map and going, you know what? Oh, these explorers. I'm going to put this fish on there anyways because pff, they don't know better. Ah! <laughs> and then, you know, that's what he would have done. So the cartographer adds those ancient cool coordinates and then everybody's like, what the hell is this? But, you know, nobody questions it too much because it looks really good. You know, I don't know. I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but it could have. I mean, that might be historically accurate. I don't know. Anyways, the point is, is that it happened. And, unfortunately, mainstream historians will actually use this kind of stuff against us. You know, and another thing that a mainstream historian will very rarely admit is that there were really good ancient source maps that these cartographers had access to. 
even though these cartographers openly admit, I mean, they literally tell us we were copying from source maps from earlier times, mainstream still ignores that claim. So when we look at these maps, we cannot just discard them simply because it does not line up with whatever we currently believe, right? This, this should be a freaking obvious to everybody, but for some reason, I have to make a YouTube channel that sits here and yells at mainstream historians because mainstream historians, they won't get their shit straight and just gotta... Ah! Okay, all right, okay, all right, all right. All right. We need to get to the map. All right, so let's focus on Greenland. All right, so this is the Xeno map. The Xeno map is not acknowledged, generally speaking, by the mainstream. That's okay, I don't acknowledge the mainstream either, so they can go themselves. Before we get into this, let me just lay out what I want you guys to keep in mind while we are looking at maps like this. The ramifications of cartographers during the age of sail having accurate maps of the world is insane. In fact, it essentially literally changes everything we know about history right off the bat. This, of course, is one of the main reasons why mainstream historians, they cannot acknowledge that these maps are accurate. Because if they do, what does that mean? Well, that means that there was a, an advanced culture, you know, that came before what we currently consider advanced cultures. And somehow, not only were they advanced, but they were advanced enough to where they were sailing the oceans and they were accurately charting the planet. Now, before anybody starts thinking that these guys are, you know, aliens zooming around on UFOs and everything, that, that's not it at all. That's not what we're pointing towards. What I'm, what I'm postulating is that after the Venus event took place, you know, the entire planet was essentially resurfaced. We essentially know for a fact that before the Venus event, there were human civilizations on this planet doing exceptionally well. Now, what level of technology those civilizations had, I don't know. Like, and I'm not, I'm not, well, it's not, it's out of scope of this show anyways. But they were not stupid monkeys, right? Th these guys were not just walking around banging rocks against other rocks and, and hoping that, I don't know, the rain god would rain on them or something. That, that is not what they were doing. Right. All we have to do is look around at the ruins on this planet and we know for a scientific fact that there was an advanced uh, civilization, at least one, but maybe multiple, I don't know. But the fact is, is that advanced humans existed. So once the Venus event happens, once, you know, Venus and its cometary form does its thing to Earth and absolutely destroys everything and, and wipes out entire civilizations. For example, the Atlantean civilization would have been wiped out during this period of time. Uh, any Anybody living on the continent of Mu, gone. Uh, Lemuria, whatever was there, gone. This is where all of those continents would have sank. Anyway, so whoever survived it, right, the, the, civil, the people, the remnants of this advanced civilization, no, they start picking up the pieces. And remember, they're not picking up the pieces of UFOs. You know, they're picking up generally stuff that you and I would understand. You know, generally, God knows what they actually had. But anyway, so they start picking up their pieces. And since these guys are not stupid monkeys, they're smart. They know that they have to start getting a new understanding of the planet that has been left to them by the destruction of Venus. So they start rebuilding a little bit to the best of their ability. And I don't know what kind of rebuilding they did. I don't think it was very good because whoever these guys were, they go away. They essentially die off or disappear. And I might actually have an answer for what happened to them as well, but that is out of scope for this video. So I will try to stay focused. Okay, focusing up now. All right. So the source maps that the cartographers are using are incredibly valuable to anybody who's a historian because that does several things. What that does is that shows us for a fact that humans at some point in time in history had a lot of the same capabilities 
that we have today. And by that, what I mean is being able to use trigonometry, geometry, uh, cosmology, or I should say astronomy, you know what I'm saying. Anyways, they already had this stuff locked down. Now, we already have evidence from ancient civilizations all over the planet that this stuff was going on anyways, don't we? Of course, mainstream completely ignores all of it, but what these maps do is they help solidify that these people, whoever they were, actually existed. And if they existed, that means we have no idea what's going on in our past. That means mainstream is absolutely off its rocker. It is full of nothing but lies and deceit and all. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, yeah, I've been talking for like 40 minutes and we're not even at what I wanted to originally talk about. All right, all right. Well, it's a good thing nobody watches this garbage. All right, so really quick. Uh, let me just give you guys a fast background on what the Xeno map is, and then we'll we'll build our stuff up from there. All right, so the map's history goes like this. The original compilation lay unpublished until, in the 16th century, G. Ruscali, a descendant of the Xenos, discovered it among old family papers and printed it in 1558. Now, something to note, and I want to make sure that I'm on an even playing field here, is that during this period of time, we also know that there are tons of forgeries going on as well, right? And, and that's not just in maps. I mean, it, it's more, you know, it's more in the book side of things. It's more in the historic side of things. But that does not mean that fake maps were not drawn. I mean, they were, and I admit that. So I just want to make sure that we understand this so that we do look at it in a critical light and objective that's what we're trying to do here anyway so eventually the map gets reprinted in ptolemy's celebrated world atlas so right off the bat this is interesting that people thought it was real enough to put some stock into it and to even include it in what were essentially considered the most comprehensive atlases currently existing in civilization at that time you know european civilization anyway so you know that actually says something in my opinion i mean if they're willing to put it in there that means that there must have been something to it that these guys probably maybe knew something more than what we knew now i mean i guarantee it, they know stuff that we don't know now obviously so they may have been more comfortable with it back in the day maybe because they already knew that hey look we know there's a landmass up there we just don't know what it looks like now since the last catastrophe that that might have actually been a mindset of some of the cartographers it's really important to remember that the psychological mindset of the people back then during their current you know local culture and what they knew it's completely different from what we know and think nowadays obviously i know i know that sounds obvious and stupid but it makes a huge difference if the cartographers and people back during this period were already well aware potentially of precursor civilizations coming before them and they knew that they still had some remnants of those cultures and they were using them as a foundation to build up new maps so that's also something just to keep in mind okay oh yeah ptolemy so ptolemy is interesting as well yeah i know you know we'll probably we probably won't get to the xeno map or any of that stuff until another show i'm not going to lie but let's set the stage let's see where this goes all right so remember uh ptolemy is interesting when we look at real chronology so right now we have ptolemy existing around you know 150 a.d ish or so but what is weird about Ptolemy is that for some weird reason, during the Age of Sail, all of these cartographers who are a thousand plus years, you know, Ptolemy's senior, for some weird reason, nothing happens in that span of a thousand-ish years. And so, for, and so Ptolemy is still essentially looked on as the cartography god. Now, this is weird because, I mean, so basically what mainstream tells us is that Ptolemy, you know, did this amazing work up to 150 AD and he was kicking ass. And then all of a sudden we get nothing. 
we get no advancements in cartography or anything really because this is when the dark ages magically appear in the mainstream timeline so the dark ages go through and of course the dark ages lasted anywhere between you know well basically probably you can easily say a thousand years you know 800 to a thousand years anyway um, and then all of a sudden cartography and exploration pick right back up where it left off and this is the problem with stuff like the dark ages now i've already gone to great lengths to prove the dark ages are scientifically wrong the dark ages never existed so if the dark ages never existed if we get rid of say a thousand years suddenly ptolemy does not exist in 150 a.d ptolemy now exists in 1150 a d if we move ptolemy and all of those really skilled map makers that you know ptolemy would have had around him out of the second century a d and we move him into the 12th century a d suddenly history starts to make a little more sense because if we get rid of the dark ages and we move ptolemy into the 12th century a d now it is no longer weird that cartographers, you know, in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, you know, still thought highly of Ptolemy and still used his maps because they were not over a thousand years old. These maps were almost, or well, depending on, you know, who, which cartographer you are, uh, Ptolemy's maps are not old. They are contemporary or almost contemporary with the cartographers themselves. I only bring this up because if we are going to trust the validity of the maps that we are going to go over, yeah, one day we'll get to a map, I swear, probably in the next show now, but whatever. Um, but if we are going to take these maps seriously, we really do need to have a good grasp of the knowledge that these guys potentially would have realistically had access to. What makes this even more interesting is that if we are going to eliminate a lot of the phantom time that currently exists in mainstream chronology, we actually should expect to find things like the Ptolemy aspect, right? Suddenly, you know, all of these cartographers living in the age of sail, they're no longer idolizing some dude that, you know, was a thousand plus years old. They're idolizing a dude that is their contemporary. That makes infinitely more sense than anything the mainstream has come up with, right? I mean, we have we have Ptolemy existing, then we have nothing for a thousand plus years, and then everybody literally picks up right where they left off. All right, that, that, that makes no sense. I don't care how you try to spin that. So what are the ramifications then of these guys having access to source maps to where they could create something like the Xeno map or like the Pierre Reese map or any of these maps that portray land masses that no longer exist in our period of time? Ah, yeah, okay, so we are definitely not going to get through the Xeno map today. That's all right, we'll do it in a different show to where I will promise to focus 100% on it, and I will use that episode to try to get better at focusing. All right, speaking of focusing, which we are no longer doing, uh, let's focus on what the ramifications are of something like Greenland not having any ice. So if Greenland does not have any ice on the Xeno map, what does that tell us about whoever recorded it? Well, it tells us that there's, well, it tells us one of two things. It means one, these guys really did have UFOs and scanning technology, and they just went up there, zipped around, and then they recorded it, and then they came back and then drew it on a piece of hide with some really rudimentary ink, and then used that as their map for some weird reason. But that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the people who went and were going up to the Greenland area to map it saw Greenland without any ice. Now, if we take a quick look at the Xeno map, I mean, it not only shows the coastline, it also shows the interior, just like the Pierre Reese map does. This is essentially solid evidence that sometime very recently, 
humans actually were around at a good technological level that could map this stuff and they were alive and well during a time where there was no ice on these continents. So let's, yeah, all right, so let's use that as real evidence, all right? So I'm going to take this and I'm gonna use it as real scientific evidence because the reality is there's no reason for us not to use this as scientific evidence. We'll get into the Xenomap and all the very interesting map stuff with it in the next show, but if we look at the Pierre Reese map, for example, you know, that's the one that everybody knows anyways. You can find all kinds of works nowadays that go on ahead and they really do work out and show that that is indeed Antarctica without any ice. So if our ancestors were sailing around at the poles, you know, in what should have been freezing cold temperatures, right, it should have been difficult to get up there. Now, one of the reasons why Antarctica took so long to get down to is just because the environment sucks. I mean, if you're sailing from Europe, you know, the distance matters as well, obviously. But ultimately, one of the reasons why people didn't go down there was simply because it was inhospitable. So to have maps showing any kind of version of Antarctica is already insane. You know, Greenland's is also a little weird as well. But, you know, people were more used to sailing around that area uh, because they're right there. So at least distance was not a horrible factor. So that was a lot easier to navigate so when we find something like Antarctica that's insane even if Antarctica had ice on that map it still would have been insane I mean even if the Pierre Reese map showed Antarctica all frozen and whatever that still would have changed history but the fact that they found the Pierre Reese map without ice in Antarctica that that changes everything I don't care who you are it does not matter what history you study that changes everything with human history Right? That, that's all the proof you really need to know that something is going on. Now, with respect to the Greenland situation, nobody really gives credit to anybody mapping that northern area, really. I mean, no, there's not like, nobody's over there, you know, cheering Greenland on being mapped. I mean, nobody cares that Iceland was mapped. Everybody forgot about Friesland. And the reason why nobody really made a big fuss about any of these mappings is because it's right there. I mean, the rea it's funny, nobody gives credit to Europeans for going and mapping out some of the most difficult areas that you could go and try to map out because people just look at the maps and they say, well, it's not that far away, bro. I mean, what, did they sail for like two days and they mapped it and they came back home? I mean, that's not really an expedition. I mean, it's right there. Th that, that, I mean, as far as I can tell, that's kind of, the way that most people look at that situation mapping those areas up there in the northern hemisphere like up there in the the north the arctic circle i mean that's not a joke either you know it would suck going down to antarctica but it sucks going up to the arctic as well so any map that was starting to appear at any point in time would have already been you know a nice advancement so when we start to find a map that has no snow cover on it and it starts to match what we have discovered in modern times, something is going on. There's something up with Greenland. And we will get to that in the next show. Yeah, I know, I totally screwed this one up too. I just started rambling. But you know, there's some valuable crap in this show. You know, we went over ice cores. We went over some of the basics of, you know, the hardships that we should acknowledge were there for any explorer trying to map out anything in the Arctic or the Antarctic circle. I mean, that's, that's not bad, right? It was like, I mean, it's probably not really worth your time, but hey, you know, okay. I mean, it's not like you were going to go out and fight the powers that be, right? I mean, it's not like anybody was going to do anything like that. So you might as well spend your time with me and watch or listen to this garbage. Don't watch this. It's, there's, it's, it's just AI slop. That's all this crap is. Okay, next, next show, I promise. I will focus on the Xeno map and we will go over all of that information and then we will see if we can't use that information to paint a picture about what Earth looked like immediately 
after the Venus event. And by immediately, by the way, I mean, you know, maybe, I don't know how long it would have taken them to recover. That's actually something we should talk about as well. Because, you know, hey, a big Earth-destroying catastrophe happens. You know, there are some survivors. How long does it take a civilization to recover? Right? How long would it really take to kind of get moving and shaking again, get ships out there back on the sea, or the ocean, or whatever, and start mapping out all of the new terrain that would have been created from that Venus event cataclysm? Yeah, yeah, we gotta talk about that. I won't waste your time here anymore, we're done. Alright, we will continue the Xenomap in the next episode of this particular series or whatever the hell this is it doesn't matter anyways nobody cares or watches this why am i even doing